I appreciate that. So uh, thanks to all of you for uh, showing up the morning after St. Patrick's Day. Thumbs up, very good. And I'm Carmen Medina, and this is Julia Mossbridge. And we're here to talk to you about preemptive intelligence and uh, precognition. So I'm going to ask a, a question of the audience, just curious about state of interest, state of knowledge here. The question is going to have three parts. Gonna ask you whether or not which who among you have had a precognitive experience no don't don't raise your hands yet i'm sorry see this is this isn't working julia no there uh, uh what is it premature hand raising <laughs> but uh we'll uh, uh we'll ask you have you had a precognitive experience are you curious about precognition or are you skeptical about it? But before you raise your hands, I wanted Julia to give uh, an explanation of precognition so that we level set. Yeah, so it's like clear what we're talking about, at least in this room for this next hour. Um, okay, so sometimes you have a thought and you don't know where the thought comes from. It just comes into your head. It could be a visual image that comes into your mind's eye, it could be a sound, an idea, a sense, a feeling that you have to do something. And we're going to call that a thought. And in this case, uh, in this example, it's a thought that there's this guy who looks sort of like Zelensky on a screen, and there's people in front of him, and there's American flags. And let's say you had this thought, uh, yeah, yeah, it's hard to see. It's kind of through a glass darkly, right? It's a little vague. It's a little unclear, right? But you have this thought. Let's say you have this thought in October of... 2021, and you're like, what does this have to do with the price of tea in China, right? And then a couple days ago, an event happens where Zelensky actually uh, speaks to Congress, right? Gives an address to Congress, and you go, whoa, I remember when I had that weird thought back in October of 2021 and couldn't relate it to anything because I didn't even actually know who Zelensky was. And now I see, given that my conscious experience is that time is moving forward like that, that it feels like this was precognitive. I had an actual experience that came before the event that matched in multiple details with the future event. And it was not an event that I controlled or even knew much about. It was not an event that was predictable. I had it far enough in advance so that it's not like the world events at the time in October of 2021 very clearly suggested anything like this, and if I had known that this, is, this thought was actually a reflection of future reality, I could have actually prepared, I could have, I have, could have made some changes or, or talked to someone who knew something about it. So this is what we call precognition, and I'm a scientist who's been studying precognition for the last 15 years. You can actually study this in the lab. This is an example of spontaneous precognition, much harder to study in the lab, but you can study this in the laboratory and in physiology and behavior, looking at all sorts of different systems, you can see that the experience that people have been having for thousands of years of prophecy, of premonition, of what we call scientifically precognition, is in fact an experience that is verifiable with uh, random and controlled, a random number generator and controlled methods in the laboratory. So this talk is not about that precognition is real, this talk is about how we might use something like this in intelligence analysis. And just so that you're not sitting around thinking the obvious question that most people would think right now, I'm going to try to answer it for you in a, in a not very satisfying way, but in a way. And the question is, well, how could something like that work? I mean, in our conscious experience, time is moving in one direction. Holy cow. How, if this is actually real and scientifically verified, how would that work? And so one possible explanation is that physicists don't get to tell psychologists how the mind works. So mental, <laughs> mental things, like experiences, don't follow the same rule, rules as physical things. And so it's possible that the subconscious mind actually has access to information leaking back in time from the future in the way that a ball rolling down an inclined plane does not. 
So now that you have asked my question, now you can answer your question. Okay, so now that you know, for those who didn't come in, you're going to raise your hand and put yourself in one of three categories. You had a precognitive session or experience in your life. You are curious about precognition or you're skeptical about it. So those who have had a precognitive experience in their lives, raise your hands. It's most of, I'd say it's about half, yeah? How would you know? Well, well, how would you know? Well, you know if, yeah, you would know if you've had it. This kind of thing happens to you. Come this to kind of thing that I was just referring. Okay, two, how many of you are just, not just, because there's no value attached to these. How many of you are curious? Okay, so I think some people are raising their hands more than once, and I guess that's allowed. That's allowed. And how many of you are skeptical? Okay, so I think people, some people have had an experience, are curious, and are skeptical. And that includes me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so let's talk about this as a human capability. Um, so let's live in the space for the next hour or so. That precognition, that you might actually believe me, that precognition has been scientifically verified. Let's live in that possible as a sort of space. Let's talk about it as a human capability. Let's talk, let's compare it to musical ability. So here's a nice bell curve. About 5% of people have agnusia, so they can't hear beats, they can't hear tones. They don't say, oh, I'm tone deaf, I'm rhythm deaf. That, so they're amusic. About 15% of people are gifted in music. And the rest of the 80% of us we're musical. I mean, we can hum, we can sing happy birthday, we don't listen to music and say, what is that? Right? This is a common cultural, cross-cultural experience of music as a human capability and a human experience that enriches our lives. Okay. So, let's call precognition a super capability because of the current cultural context. It seems like that. It seems like a superpower. It seems out of, quite out of the ordinary, really, even though um, at least my data suggests that it's not at all. Um, I think it's very similar in terms of the breakdown. About 5% of people, I would say, have aprecogia, which I made up, or they're aprecogs, meaning they just don't have access, even through their subconscious mind, to information about future events of importance. And about 15% of people are gifted. They have excellent access to information about future events that are of importance to them or others. And 80%, I would say about 80% of people are basically just, you're run-of-the-mill precognitive. Your unconscious mind is getting this information, your conscious mind is unaware of it. And you can, I can do experiments, other people in the field can do experiments to reveal that your unconscious mind actually knows about the future event, even though you don't think that you do. Or that your body knows about the future event, even though you don't think that you do. One of the weird things about being in this field is you don't even have to screen people, and this is why I can kind of say this with some confidence, you don't have to screen people for this skill to show that they have it. On average, people have this skill. So you could show statistically reliable effects, and you could start to investigate the phenomenon, ask, what about a person helps you have this skill? What about a particular task or stimulus setup allows you to have this skill? But I want, what's different about this in music is around only 3% of people, I would estimate, are both gifted at this ability and unsuppressed by the cultural taboo. And so that's the difference. With music, if your kid hums or is able to play piano, you might encourage them and say, hey, we're going to get you a piano teacher. Oh, you, you might be very musical. If your kid says, hey, mommy, tomorrow you're going to drop the cookies on the floor, you might say, well, that's crazy. And then the next day, if you drop the cookies on the floor, you might be like, I'm a little worried about my kid. And if this happens over and over again, you might get very concerned because you don't understand it and it's not culturally accepted or encouraged. So I really think there's a, there's a work to do here, in my view, of letting people understand that this is a super capability, or really a human capability, cross-cultural, that doesn't need to be suppressed. So that is my note on that. Okay, so my background is I uh, spent 33 years at CIA. I was tempted there to cross myself. So. <laughs> you know, like when the vampire's in the room, yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, and uh, I um, spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, and I was a manager of analysts, and I spent a lot of time interested less in a particular part of the world 
and more in what is good thinking. How do we generate good ideas? And in particular, the thing that really matters for the CIA and the intelligence community when we're advising our uh, decision makers is to give them some idea of what might happen in the future. And this proves to be extremely difficult. After the, uh, the twin debacles of 9-11 and the absence of WMD in Iraq, uh, I was actually in the executive team that was running the CIA at the time, and we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could improve analysis. So they, uh, the way that, 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 that we did, uh, uh, you know, before then, sort of we, we raised experts. I'm the expert on Ukraine, I'm the expert on South Africa, I'm the expert on Bolivia. And uh, we didn't, when they made a judgment, or a call, as we would say, you make a call, they didn't actually have to explain themselves. They didn't have to unpack their thinking. And after we had these twin crises, we spent a lot of time thinking about, you have to unpack how you think so that we know what the basis of your ideas are and we can make judgments as to their credibility, validity, reliability. So there's a lot of structured analysis that was done at the CIA and it's done now and that's very rational. It assumes a, very, a quite rational cause and effect world. Introspection is what we do when we're trying to get people to talk about the steps that they've taken in their thought process. And let me ask you, if any of you have ever tried to do that, it's extremely difficult to unpack your thinking. Intuition is what, as Julia says, happens to all of us. A thought enters our mind and we don't know where it came from. And we don't ask ourselves usually where it came from. And we don't, if it ends up being a good thought, we don't really know how to train ourselves to have thoughts like that enter our, our minds more frequently and more reliably. And precognition, I would say, as the slide says, is intuition on steroids. So it is, I think, possible that when a thought enters our mind, when our mind recognizes a pattern of activity in such a way that we're not consciously aware of how it recognized that pattern of activity, I think it's possible that sometimes those thoughts that are entering our mind are leaking into our mind from the future. And that is what precognition is. Uh, okay, what is intuition? Well, intuition is uh, related to, you know, it's, it's very much connected with creativity. Uh, it is open to new ideas. It's about our imagination, our, our process, and our intuition is almost always about the future. It can be about the past. You can have this intuition that X person is lying to you, for example, and you don't know what you sense about their body language that indicates uh, a lying, but, but you know it's there. Your brain has figured it out. And intuition is important because when we engage in intuition, what are the kinds of things that allow it to flourish? So we spend a lot of time thinking in terms of uh, analogy and metaphor. So here's a metaphor for the war on Ukraine. The war on Ukraine is like a bitter, failed romance. Now, I don't know if that's useful or true, for that matter, but spending some time with a group of people, think of all the ways the war in Ukraine is like a failed romance, might generate some really interesting new ways of framing the issue. And all of those things are interesting. None of them are necessarily precognition, but uh, they're, they're kind of part of a spectrum, right? Where you have this structured, material, materialistic, evidence-based thinking, and you have something else that is happening, perhaps as a group, a group activity, brainstorming. Thoughts enter your mind, and I think at one end of the spectrum is the possibility of precognition. Cool. So, how does intuition work? Well, first of all, no one knows, so whatever I say next is going to be my story about it. <laughs> um, so here's my story about it. Um, you may have heard about, uh, let's see, maybe you read, how many people read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Fast and Slow? Yeah, yeah, like a third of people. 
and you've, the other folks have probably heard about it. So the upshot is there's these two systems, system one and system two. <laughs> Great names because you'll always forget which one is which. <laughs> system one is actually a useful name in the sense that it comes first. It's the first processor of information in your brain. And it's mostly unconscious. It's very fast. It's first. It's very fast. It's massively parallel. It's drawing from it. It can, it can look at a ton of raw data and process it. It's, it's very much like machine or learning algorithms in that way. You could just have just thousands of factors and it's processing it. It's, you, can, you can make decisions using system one with many factors feeding into it. It's sometimes biased, which is the primary trait that is discussed in the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's often accurate, which is not often discussed in the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. In fact, that book made people start to believe that what we better do is super focus on system two because we want to be rational and deliberate. Do you have an example on that? Yeah, let's yeah, do an I example okay. here. Well, let me, uh, so how many people in the crowd are bilingual? Speak, because I thought this, you know, very international. I speak, I, I learned Spanish first, then I went to English. When I speak Spanish or English, I'm not translating. I'm not doing any conscious system to activity to turn English thoughts into Spanish or vice versa. My brain does it for me immediately, immediately, immediatamente, uh, right? <laughs> Didn't do it that well right there. Uh, and that, I think, is a really interesting example of system one being powerful, convenient, and accurate. And yet, we have this bias now to dismiss it. Yeah, and I'm going to give you another example, okay. which is you can, in this experiment, uh, let's see, was done by, um, I think it was Lee Nord Nordgren and Dijkster, who is not sure that, the, that I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. Um, but it's this experiment where you ask a bunch of undergraduates, I'm going to describe two cell phones to you and you describe them with four traits, and one cell phone with those four traits is obviously the worst cell phone that you've ever heard of, like, doesn't ever work inside, you know, just <laughs> bad, bad features. And the other one has positive features. And then you give a two-minute break, and then you bring it back and you say, now I'm gonna to continue to describe the cell phones to you, and this time you, you describe them with equally positive and negative features. You say they still include the features we talked about before the break, but here's some additional features. So now after the break, they, they are equally positive and negative. They sort of seem like men. There's no difference between them. When you distract um, system two by saying, we want you, system two, to work on this deliberate, thoughtful task, kind of like a crossword puzzle or something, System one, then, if you, if you say, hey, by the way, while you're doing this difficult task, uh, which phone do you think is the best phone? System one gives the right answer. It's the one that includes all the information from before the break, as well as the information after the break. System two gives the wrong answer. It goes, it doesn't know. It says, I don't know which one. So this is another example of system one actually uh, providing better information and faster. Um, system two is slower, it's largely conscious. We're fairly biased towards what we consciously experience as being really important, so that's interesting. It's serial. It can actually deal with decisions. It does well with decisions that have about four or less factors. How many life decisions or world policy decisions have four or less factors? Um, it's, it's also biased because it gets information from system one and because it has its own biases. And it's often less accurate which is the thing, again, that's not talked about a lot. So how does intuition work? Um, it's a bonding of these two systems. Both are important. You need to have one checking on the other. You don't throw away system two just because it's overemphasized lately. And you don't ignore system one just because a rationalist says that system one is BS. You integrate these two. We've evolved for a long time to have these two systems, so they must be used together. And one uh, sort of very, well, not sort of, very controversial and kind of oddball experiment that the U.S. government and the intelligence community did from 1972 to 1995 was something that ended up being called Stargate, but had a bunch of different names before that. And it was about integrating System 1 with System 2, 
and using um, this integration as a way to precognitively get information about future events and also not precognitively, but the best results um, as analyzed after the fact in 1995 were from the precognitive components of this. And, and in fact, since then, uh, anyone who actually looks at the data is hard pressed to say that precognition is not actually something that is a real significant phenomenon. greater than chance. Yeah, uh, continue to be significantly greater than chance, but. Well, here's the question. Is precognition too woo-woo for the intelligence community? So I met Julia a couple of years ago when uh, she was introduced to, uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend, and uh, she didn't try to hide what she was working on, precognition, and my initial reaction was, whoa, you know, I, I'm not so sure about this. But uh, why do we think of it as woo-woo? Well, I think, you know, we live in a world where we the uh, parameters of acceptable knowledge have been set as knowledge that can be touched, felt, measured, that exists in the material world. And if you know anything about physics, uh, physics constantly is trying to figure out how everything that it observes that is known about the universe, and of course that's an ongoing process, uh, how to put it all together so that it fits with the rules of the material world. And as, if you know anything about physics, you're having a really hard time doing that, right? And uh, the pro what's the problem with that thinking, in, in my opinion? So, I like to say, and this is one of the things that I learned uh, being an intelligence professional, is our ability to know is a function of our tools for knowing. So when you read the history of cosmology, Galileo, one of the great figures of uh, advances in our understanding of the universe, people know a lot of things about Galileo. What was his occupation? How, was, how did he actually make money? In, uh, in Italy. Anyone know? Sorry? No, no, no. I don't think they're really paid. <laughs> An astrologer would have paid, but not an astronomer. Anyone know? Not, not really. He was, yes. <laughs> he was Italy's best telescope maker. Aha! That makes sense, right? So the tool that you have for knowledge is, uh, 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 your knowledge is, depends upon that tool. And there's a kind of a corollary that when we get a, a set of tools and we fall in love with those set of tools, then we think only that knowledge that can be measured by that set of tools is real. And that's the trap that we're in now when we're thinking about precognition. Uh, we have no way of measuring it or not enough good ways to measure it. I, you can we have it. great ways to yeah, measure okay, it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but whatever those ways to measure are not persuasive enough, and we are caught in a status quo that thinks that only what can be known physically and measured materially is real. Can I speak briefly to Yes, the, please. Yeah. So when Carmen says it's not persuasive enough, the problem is not that the measurement isn't persuasive enough. It's the problem is that people aren't persuaded by measures when the cultural context says that it's something can exist. Better put, I agree. So yeah, Being Jessica Utz, who is the um, president of the American Statistical Association in 2016, um, and who is very familiar, she was hired by the CIA to examine the Stargate work, and it has been made herself familiar with the work since then. Um, said to the audience in her presidential address. So what statistical evidence would you need to accept this? Because, you know, the statistical evidence, if, this, if the statistical evidence for precognition were applied to, say, some drug, you'd say, well, I'll take the drug because clearly it works, right? So she said, what would you need? And they're like, no, 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 talking amongst themselves. And she said, okay, would you rather have more statistical evidence for precognition? Or would you rather have your own very compelling experience? Raise your hand. So she had them raise their hand. Three-fourths of the audience, my own very compelling experience. They're statisticians, so their job is to show how statistics actually tells you something about the way the, way the world works. But they, they want, want an their, anecdote. They want an anecdote. They want an anecdote. So, yeah, so there's that.
Okay, so is uh, uh, precognition too impractical for intelligence work? It, it, it might be. Uh, you know, because the program was stopped in 1995, there's no searchable uh, track record, uh, you know, really to understand how to use insights drawn from precognition to make important national security decisions. You would have to have been working with the same people in controlled uh, conditions for a very long time, understand their own strengths, et cetera, and, and none of that exists right now. And the results can be difficult to interpret. And, and I should at this point tell a, a quick story about my own uh, compelling personal experience. So I met Julia, I took a remote viewing course or a precognitive course with her. We're going to do a small experiment in a few minutes uh, with you all so you'll have a better idea of what I'm talking about. But basically you do a meditation. After you've completed the, med the meditation, then you are told what your target was. <laughs> because if you're told what your target was before you do your meditation, we are all great storytellers. We will manufacture a story in meditation that is probably just something that's in our head, derived from whatever is in our mind at the time, and has nothing to do with precognition. Anyway, I did this, I did my activity, I was told this was around September of uh, 2019, 2020, September of 2020, I was told afterwards the target was describe inauguration day January 20th, uh, 2021. And I looked at the pieces of paper I had, and. I had the letter J upside down, sideways, you know, I thought that was interesting, but eh, you know, whatever. So March of 2021, after the January 6th riots, I'm cleaning up some papers. I find the papers from that session, and I look at them again, because I'm about to put them in a file or something. A piece of paper that was part of that session that I hadn't even focused on, I look at it again, and it has the word accordion on it, weird, right? I mean, weird, whoever thinks of accordion. And then it says, no, not accordion concertina. Mm. <laughs> Who said that? that was <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, I don't know how many of you know, the other term for barbed wire is concertina wire. Now, September 2021, I had a precognitive session where the words concertina popped into my mind. I have no explanation for that. I'm not com convinced it's some weird coincidence. But at the same time, how could you have utilized that to give advance warning for what was uh, occurring? I mean, in my own mind, I thought first I was thinking about accordions. So that's an example of what it's... Uh, Someone would have to know your mind well and have been working with you. I'm like, okay, Carmen loves to, you know, get really specific with her metaphors or whatever. Or, right. or whatever, right. And then another thing, you know, these, this activity that was done pre-1995, the Stargate activity, one, it never really involved the analysts, people that are trained to be structured and intuitive thinkers. So that, I think, was a flaw. Two, almost all of the work was based on identifying buildings, you know, you know, tell us what's at this coordinate. That really seems to me a waste of time. We have fantastic national technical means, and now we have fantastic privately owned means, you're seeing this in the war in Ukraine, to identify buildings, you know, you don't need precognition for that. If you're going to use precognition for these sorts of interesting purposes, you really ought to be thinking about how could you use it to uncover human intentions and motivations and what people are thinking that we otherwise have no way of identifying. Right, and what people will be thinking in a couple weeks. So, this is my vision of how we might use precognition and intelligence analysis today. This is coming from the side of someone who trains people in precognition. Not, I don't know anything about the intelligence community except for what I've heard from Carmen. So I think there's this stare approach. By the way, the stare approach, if you've ever seen the men who stare at goats, you know that there's this like, kind of an inside joke. Um, <laughs> but um, this approach you can actually use for training any kind of perceptual skill. So that's actually my background is training perceptual skills. So first, screen. So you want to screen in-house analysts. And actually, a guy named Doug Morris wrote in 2010 wrote a uh, master's thesis for the National Intelligence University about using 
of remote viewing uh, slash, which is another name for often precognitive work, um, to, you, to, to inform intelligence. And he made a real big point about you want to use in-house people. You don't want a group of people who are contractors who just do this in some kind of cell. You want people who are familiar with the vocabulary and the concepts in the area that you're looking into. So train, T is for train gifted individuals. So after the screening, um, known and unknown outcomes. So if you know an outcome, because you know, because it's, for instance, US action, if you're in the US, then train them on that and see how they do because you can instantly find out if they're any good, right? So first you screen them and then you find out also if you can screen them again. And then you're gonna screen them again. You're gonna assess them for outstanding ability. Who gets 80% or better, correct? Now, you're gonna integrate the insights that you get from that elite group of people into a basically red teams or scenario scoping process. So you're not giving a briefing to the president saying, you know, our psychics say this. <laughs> you're saying to the red teams or scenario scopers, hey, have you thought of this? Have you thought of Russia just going, putting most of their military into the Ukraine and just going ape shit on them, right? Um, and then you repeat to maintain precognitive skills in your team. So that's the way I think it could work. And this is a, this is a real, sort of, this is the 2050 track. So this is looking well ahead. So let's look at something a little more proximal. So um, we need to, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we don't do very well in the intelligence community is we don't make any effort to train people on intuition, practice their intuition, put them in a place where interesting thoughts could enter, enter their heads. And this is something that uh, both Julie and I are interested in doing, is having these pre-cognitive cognitive sessions or meditation sessions that help people tune into their intuition better and therefore are in a better position to harvest those insights that our system one thinking has to offer us and yet we don't grab them. And the other thing that we need to do, you know, I, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, there's lots of research going on right now in quantum physics, in uh, all sorts of different types of uh, consciousness research. And one of the things that's quite controversial is first, what is consciousness? And second, what is time? And you know, we may experience time as a linear process, but when you look at it through the perspective and what is known of the behavior of, of quantum particles, time doesn't seem linear at all. So one of, the th one of the things that I've always thought the intelligence community did a bad job of was keeping abreast of research in other fields that would have application on the work of the intelligence community. And all this work on consciousness and, and quantum physics, uh, spooky particles at a distance, all of that I think eventually has an application to how we think about thinking and thinking about the future in the intelligence community. Amen. So we're going to do a precognition demo, which is not an experiment. So one of the real, the, one of the problems with being a scientist who studies this stuff, and also a person who experiences precognition on a regular basis, is that people often can't hold in their heads this dichotomy. They can't believe that you can both be a scientist who's using your system two a lot to analyze things, and be an intuitive person who's using your system one a lot, which is ironic or perhaps paradoxical, I don't know. I don't know either. But anyway, it's one of those things because, um, because almost every scientist who does well in their career is both very intuitive and very analytical. Like all the time you talk to scientists about where they get their ideas, they don't say, well, I just thought about every possible logical path and then after five years I finally figured it out. They say, I took a shower and then I was looking at the soap and then it occurred to me, blah, right? So what we're gonna do is a precognition demo, and the reason I say it's not an experiment is I want you to understand that as a scientist, when I'm actually doing an experiment, it's much more controlled than talking to a group of people <laughs> about this. So we're doing a demo so you can understand the structure of this kind of experiment without actually doing an experiment. 
So just bring me back to, to mind that you have a precognition, which is an experience. We could use any sensory modality or all of them. You could be conscious or unconscious of it. It could be a, a motivational experience. It could be a, like a full-fledged prophet, prophetic experience. And that then in the future there's an event and the intention is to relate your experience to the event. If you're going to do intentional precognition, which we'll do in this experiment, we're going to intentionally try to relate our experience to the event. That doesn't mean it's going to work. It doesn't mean that your experience will be related to the event. So the event, I can tell you right now, I am going to tell you that the target will be in the future. That's your first clue about the target. I don't know what the target is, and neither does Carmen, nor does anyone on the planet, because we'll use a random number generator to pick a target. And we won't do that until after we've had the experience. And the whole thing will ask you, for those who want to participate, to go it's all to... all voluntary. Yeah. yeah, it's all voluntary. And the whole thing will ask you to record your experience at that uh, website where there's a... And like it's a anonymous. Form. It's anonymous, you know, and you don't have to participate if you don't want to. Yeah, and if you want to give us your email address, there's a place for that. Yeah. In case you think you're a hotshot precog. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, Going to Las Vegas. That's right. <laughs> You'll be there right now. Um, then a random number generator will pick the target, and then you'll experience the target. So that's what we're going to do. Carmen's going to take us through this meditation to so get, this to get us in this space. So this will take us about uh, five to ten minutes max. Yeah, and then we'll go and then we're quickly. Gonna, and then we're going to go to questions, yeah. which could include any questions you have, including comments that you might want to share about your precognitive experience or lack of their lack of thereof. Or yeah, or upset at us for getting it wrong. Yeah, exactly. All right. So am I starting? You're, you're helping us meditate. Okay, so are we gonna... We're not gonna turn off the lights until... Uh, until the target. Until the target, okay. So uh, I want you all to uh, you know, get comfortable and uh, I want you to uh, you know, maybe take a breath or, or two. Uh, you can close your eyes or not, however you feel about it. And I, I want you to think of that you're in a, a long hallway. It's going to take you 10, 20 steps to go down the hallway, but at the end of the hallway, there's a door. And you're, you're motivated to go open that door. And you're, you're conscious of how you feel. You're conscious of what you're smelling. Conscious physically of your body. Start walking down the hall. You get there closer to the door. Closer to the door. You reach out your hand, you open the door. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you smell? That's what you need to focus on now. And Are there colors? Yeah. Are there textures? Are there objects? Is there motion? I'll stop now. And if anything surprises you, take note of it. Yes. Do not edit yourself. When you feel you know what you saw, you can write it down. You can go to our tiny girl. Just put it there. There's a little series of questions there.
So we'll go two or three more minutes. Let's see some people are still in. Okay, yep. okay I'm going to tell you in about 10 seconds I'm going to take a screenshot of my phone so I know what time it is when we started getting the target ready. So just because when I analyze the data, I am going to analyze the data, okay. um, I, I am going to want to know what time we got the target so someone can't put in exactly what the target is into the form. After. Um, okay, so what we need now I'm going to turn off the lights so that we can see the target when it comes up. I'll turn it back on for the Q&A later. Um, what we need is someone to... Oh, look, I put the clicker here. So the bystander effect, I'm not going to just add, randomly ask someone to, um, to, to go to random.org. So I'm just going to pick you because you are very confident. Uh, would you, on your phone, go to random.org? And put in a that's a random number generator service. Put in a minimum of one and four and a maximum of four. There's like four possible targets. So I just want to know which one is our target. Uh, minimum four and maximum of four. Yeah, and then just hit generate. Okay. All right, what'd you get? One. Okay. So all right, here's our target. Oh. <laughs> So can you full screen it or make? Uh, yeah, we'll play it twice, and I'll make sure there's audio. It's hard to get the audio. Can I full screen it, Carmen? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't think so because it's vertical. We'll play it again. Let's say, gorilla in the bush. I took this video. Really? Yeah. Do you know the name of the gorilla? It's a uh, Rwanda. Well. I would if I went back and looked at the records. It's one of the mountain gorillas in, in Rwanda, and, and it's a particular family. <coughs> so that's our target. So our intention was to report back on the gorilla, but in the past. So before we get to Q&A, and you can ask as many questions as you want about that experience or anything else, obviously. Um, but before we get to Q&A, I want to say thanks to South by Southwest for having us here. Um, the Bial Foundation, who is a funder of my work, also the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, another funder, University of San Diego, partnership there, and experiment.com, also funder of my work. If you want to follow up with us, here's our follow-up information. Um, yeah, and we're also videotaping this, so this will be out on YouTube after we edit it. Okay, great. And then for those who are curious and want to do their own research, because this wasn't a talk about the science of precognition or anything, uh, my suggestion is to go to Google Scholar and here are some great search terms. Because precognition, there's a cultural taboo. Scientists have had, to, including myself, have had to figure out what words to use that don't sound as scary to scientists. And so these are the euphemisms. <laughs> it's good to know the euphemisms. <laughs> when you're looking for this stuff. So there's a microphone over here, and we'd like to hear any questions you have, any reaction that you had to your, your session, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Hi. Why is the random generate numbers limited to one? Can you say that again? Why is the random number generator choices limited to four? Oh, because we only had four videos to uh, uh, choose from. So right. we, we found four videos uh, and uh, so the target was going to be one of those four videos. So if we found more videos. Right. So when you're doing a demo like this, you have a, what's called a target pool that has a certain number of targets in it. 
so we just picked four because we're lazy. But if you go to thepremonitioncode.com, there's a tool that has about 600 target images, and so it makes it even more difficult. Yeah. Hi, I have uh, an observation, a question. Uh, observation is, I submitted brown bear and grass, and green grass is my oh, guess. Whoa! So it's a bit whoa. freaked out when I said that. Whoa! <laughs> so maybe there is something. Uh, and can, can I comment on that? Yeah. Because, you, you know, you, you get something and you don't know what you're looking at, oh. right? And so, that's, I think that gets to the point of, of kind of training that needs to be done. Yeah to really be able to use it in, in, in reliable ways. Right, so, so if, if we were training you, we'd say don't call it a brown bear and grass because that's just what your system two labeled it. Call it, um, call it animal that is dark. Like use a lot of adjectives. A dark animal in vegetation, right? And so you get to, the more you get to the adjectives and the less you try to label things, the more you're working with system one. So that was the observation. Uh, the, the question though is, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, even for statistician, anecdotes want to be more compelling and powerful, which made me think of like gambling, for example, right? When you gamble, let's say you, you want your Red Kings or whatever, and when it comes, you are win it, I knew it. I knew for sure I would win that hand, but you don't remember all the many times that you lost. That's why we don't make a lot of money gambling, all of us. <laughs> So, so much of it is, I guess, anchoring bias or survivor bias, whatever, and, and in that sense, if we rely on anecdotes, then right. would you just be limited by that, just the fact that you remember the wins in that sense? Right, that's why she was so appalled when they said anecdote, because they should know about confirmation bias, right? So that's confirmation bias. You, you notice the thing that matches and you don't notice the billions of times it didn't match which is why you do experiments and compare the results to chance so you can actually ask, is this thing a real effect or not? So it was sort of appalling to her that all the statisticians were saying, no, I just want one experience. What I thought you were gonna say is uh, that, uh, okay, so you got brown bear in grass, but what did everybody else get, right? So, you know, you had, you know, I don't know, there's 100-ish people in this room so, did one out of a hundred get something that was useful? We'll find out on the forum. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, we'll, we'll file this question under uh, curious and skeptical all at the same time. Uh, I used to work for uh, George Friedman at Stratfor. Oh, of course, yeah. And our job was to predict geopolitical events. Uh, and they've been predicting the Ukrainian thing for 20 years. But what was interesting there is not about precognition, it was about using geography of a country that determines the behaviors of that nation state. It doesn't matter about Putin himself as the individual. He is influenced by the history of the geography of Russia that determines his desire to, to go in and protect his, uh, his, his flanks. So I'm curious, when it comes to precognition, is there not something that is physical, that is measurable, like geography that is determining these things? that maybe we're not connecting the dots on, such as, and, and I liked how you, you kind of talked about it, uh, uh, quantum physics. I, I want to know a little bit more about that. Is there something more that is measurable that we are missing that link of, and we're just saying, oh, it's just, it is a sixth sense, but right. it is actually something measurable. Yeah, I mean, I think that gets to the point that uh, we don't yet have tools that reveal to us the reality of something like quantum physics. So since we don't really have wait, wait, wait. We do, we do. We do, okay. Okay, hold on. <laughs> All right, so, you go. So, but, but to your question, you know, your question said, has this bias in it that I just want to point out. When you say, you know, maybe there's something measurable that we could, so, so we have this bias that says only physical things are measurable, but as a person who studied cognitive neuroscience, which is all about cognition, Cognition is measurable. Like, you can measure cognition. You can measure the unconscious mind. You can measure people's experiences. This is, this is what psychophysicists do, right? And so, what you don't mean is measurable, what you mean is physical. And I agree that there's something physical also. And I think, and so I just wanted to point out the bias in the question, which we all share, because we're all raised up in this culture, so no blame. 
And um, it's really important to ask, isn't there something physical here too? And so I've been personally been compelled by seeing the same phenomenon at different time scales in humans, um, in different physiological systems, in different mental systems, and it just keeps repeating itself. The prediction and the response are similar. That's one data point. There's gender differences. That's another data point. You can predict the kind of targets that will actually be effective. That's another data point. You can reliably replicate that. That's another data point. So there's something going on, and it ought to be physical too, because the brain is both mental and, and physical. So I started doing experiments in quantum mechanics. I'm not trained as a physicist, but it's why I have the collaboration with the University of San Diego in their physics department, because I started, I just had this intuition that um, if I did this particular experiment, I've never done a physics experiment in my life, but if I did this one experiment, it would show that photons are capable of predicting future events. And so I did the experiment and, and it was true. And so now I'm working that up. And I think, um, to me, and, and there's a conference actually that I'm co-facilitating co and I'm on the, I'm chairing the scientific committee for this summer for an informational time travel conference. So scientists, mostly physicists, who know that there's some kind of information leaking back from the future that you can pick up in a physical sense, especially in quantum mechanics, who are getting together to essentially create an informational time machine. So yes, there, the, what's fascinating most to me about this work is that you look at how the photons are behaving, and you can't really tell the difference between that and a physiological curve of someone's, you know, uh, skin conductance prior to an emotional event that they that they can't predict. It's, it's the same curve, and so I think there's a physical principle and a mental principle that is going in tandem that is underlying this stuff for sure. We have we have a lot of questions. And we'll talk after. Yeah. Now. Okay. So we'll, we'll be available afterwards. Yes. Thank you. Uh, a couple things, right? I, I have a small squirrel leaping down the hallway to the door. I don't know if that correlates to the gorilla or not. But uh, uh, two other things. One, I'm glad you've linked back to the physics of it, because the physics, as I understand it, and I can't comprehend, time is not linear. And so I'd really like to see a, a, a visual uh, structure of nonlinear time. How does that, what does that look like? Uh, so that kind of is a... Uh, yeah, so that's why I draw it like this. So I think of it like, have you ever, you know, bulldozers tires? Mm -hmm. So imagine the subconscious mind moving backwards in time and the conscious mind moving forward in time, but they're linked like a loop. Right. So that's the picture. Okay, my, that's my third thing is the subconscious mind and your conscious mind, system one and system two, who's in charge, and uh, <laughs> how do you tap that subconscious ability to speak Spanish or to think, or be able to think and speak Spanish without knowing whether you're speaking Spanish or English. Yeah, so that's training, right? Yeah. Right, right. So you're reminding me, uh, your second point of, uh, a comment or description that Julia makes, which I find very powerful, makes my brain itch. She goes, does the future, how do you put it? Does the future pull the past or does the past push the future? Yeah, does and the, the future answer. pull, yes. And, you know, and I, that, I, I, you know, I have to think about that a lot. And I, I still don't really get any clarity. But I, I find that that's very provocative. The idea that the future pulls the present to it. Right, so when we do machine learning algorithms to try to predict the future, which we should, we're, we're using the past. And so half of the equation is missing. All right, we're just going to, next Right, question. we'll talk after, yeah, for sure. so much for being here, it's a really great uh, session. Um, I work for a consulting company that employs a lot of futurists, so people already think we're woo, so this is on brand. Um, you were talking come closer to the microphone. Um, we employ a lot of futurists, so this is very on brand for us. We um, do a lot of participatory foresight, strategic foresight, and scenario analysis. Could you talk a little bit about how you could bring people with these skills who really excel at these skills into a process like that to supplement some of the more analytical tools? We're doing that. Yeah, that's what we're hoping to do. Uh, I mean, I guess we can say this. Uh, that uh, since they put it out in a newsletter, we're working with one company, Emergent Risk International, 
uh, to, uh, and we're going to do a workshop kind of as a test for their uh, uh, people on, on, on something like this. And then, I mean, this is truly kind of building the plane as you, as you fly it because this, is, this hasn't been done before. Not sure how much tolerance people will have for this activity. Julie and I argue about this all the time and we'll probably argue about it right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, you're going into training and you know from the get-go that not everybody has the right inclination or the uh, capability to do it well, so what's the ethics of that? But uh, yes, that's, that's definitely what we're exploring and uh, yeah. Yeah, so Emergent Risk International, you can sign up with them to take our, so they, they have a bunch of clients, and you could be one of the clients. That would be a great way to do it. Yeah. And yeah, and we'll make people feel comfortable even if they don't feel like they have the skill, because certainly 95% of the people can actually do it, and it's a matter of making them feel comfortable. And my great hope is that we just, a belief is that getting better connection to our intuition, respecting it more, exercising it more, calling upon it more, will be a huge uh, improvement to the kind of work that your company is doing, for example. Yeah, my students tend to, and our students that we've worked with now, I mean, they tend to, it, the, actually, the training itself is not really, um, the activity itself is not really the product. What is the product is the side effect of everyday experience of intuition. Okay. We only have like three minutes, so please. I'll make it, sorry, I'll make it quick. Um, so I had totally off on the video, but I did get the doors red, so that was really interesting. <laughs> but um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the IC, and I saw you talk earlier about to come. So my question really broke down. Um, how does this work when you don't have a very, like a specific pool of outcomes? Like in the example of the um, inauguration, you had yeah. concertina. But how many of your people doing this precognition need to have concertina for you to think oh, there will be an issue at the insurrection? That's, that a, that's a great way to think about it. Yeah. Uh, so we don't know, just to be brief, we don't know how it works. Uh, it hasn't been done in the intelligence community in 30 years, but it's it's low cost. So let's give it a try and learn exactly that kind of thing. Thanks. And one thing we do know is it's a team sport. Yeah. So you look for confirmation among different yeah. people. Thank you. So I saw a clear sky, so we did have failed miserably, or I looked at the sky above the grill. Um, <laughs> but uh, two quick questions. One is, uh, so a psychology class back in the 90s, they said that deja vu is a micro-memory. Is that still a philosophy of some? Certainly some people think, uh, on the outskirts, think that deja vu is actually a memory of the future. Um, and uh, when you're talking about consciousness and quantum physics, uh, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with the transcendental meditation movement, their philosophy, any of their research, and what do you think about it? Um, my husband went to um, Maharishi International University, Me so too. I'm super familiar with the transcendental meditation movement. And I think that um, the experimentation is not as careful as I would like it to be, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Yes. Um, one of the things that you, I think in one of the, the earliest slides you talked about like the ladder of, of thinking and introspection as being yeah. the way that you kind of unpack an intuitive insight and, and, and put it into analytical terms. Right. Um, I am particularly bad at that. Do you have any resources that you would recommend uh -huh. for like people who are challenged, I guess, in terms of, you know, saying, oh, I, I had this idea and like maybe, you know, it turned out it was actually a good idea, but I wasn't able to convince people or explain it to folks, you know, because it was difficult for me to unpack. You know, I, 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 I'm sorry, I can't think of a resource off the top of my head, but that's a very good idea to develop a resource, like what types of questions, it's like a turbo tax for introspection. <laughs> Did you ask yourself this? Did you think about that? I think that's a great idea. Okay, I think we can do one more. I'm going to allow the speakers a, ch a chance to answer a few more questions outside, is that that's okay? Okay, so yeah. We'll for the next session. Yeah, I know. So I think we have time for no more. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to meet you outside. Thanks for